Well, good morning. Uh, if you're joining us uh, here, great. If you're joining us online, I'm glad you're doing that. Um, mention teammates. I'm a teammate. Uh, we want to be Christ in our community. It's a great way to do it. It's a limited thing. It's an hour. I play Uno. I play all kinds of games and uh, just a way to love a kid. So I ask you to consider stopping by at the uh, booth out there. So uh, our Kent Hughes shared this insight, Winston Churchill his father, Lord Randolph Churchill, didn't like the way he looked, didn't like the sound of his voice, didn't want to be in the same room with him. Winston Churchill would later write in his memoirs, I wish, even though he was born into aristocracy, he said, I wish I'd been born into the family of a bricklayer because I would have had a natural way to get to know my dad. You know what I hear in that? The pain of a man whose father was absent, who didn't want to be with him. Sometimes when we think about our heavenly father, man, circumstances are such, and, and where is he, and he seems distant, and, and, and we feel that pain. Where, where is God when he, when he seems absent? Well, I want to talk about that this morning. So if you've got a Bible, if you'd open it to 2 Samuel chapters 5 and 6, we're going to go through these two chapters and wrestle with this question, uh, what's our hope when God seems absent? What is our hope when God seems absent? So let me just kind of set context. Israel is transitioning in the book of First and Second Samuel from a loose federation of states to a, um, a monarchy. Uh, it opens with a, a lady who's dealing with infertility. She prays and she says, if you give me a son, I'll commit him to you. And God does. In fact, he later gives her five more children. But this son is Samuel. And, and he is raised up by God to be a prophet. Israel had not had a word from God. Visions, words from God were limited. And Samuel is, is rising up. And by this time, by now, he is recognized as the voice of God. Uh, throughout First and Second Samuel, we will see that kind of the, the ubiquitous enemy of Israel are the Philistines. And they go into a battle with the Philistines. And they lose. This happened in chapter 4. And they come back and thought, you know what? The Lord defeated us. But rather than dealing with the fact that the current priest's sons were violating the sacrifice of God, and that man Eli wasn't dealing with his sons, they thought, rather than deal with those issues, they thought, well, we'll get the Ark of the Covenant, we'll take it into battle again with us with the Philistines, and God will be kind of manipulated, he'll be coerced, you can't lose the Ark in battle, and so we'll guarantee a victory. Well, that doesn't go very well. They lose the battle. They come back with information, and Eli is waiting and say, how did it go? He said, well, the runner said, it didn't go well. In fact, your two sons died today, the same day in battle, fulfilling a prophecy. Eli hears it and falls back and breaks his neck. He dies. Then his daughter-in-law is giving birth, and she dies in labor, and they name the son Ichabod, for the glory of God has departed. And that's where we are. And it doesn't look good. And you wonder, where is God? The, the Ark of the Covenant, His very presence, is in the hands of the Philistines. That's where, we, that's where we pick it up in chapter 5, verse 1. It says, Now the Philistines took the Ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Then the Philistines took the Ark of God and brought it to the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. So this is their way of saying, Israel, their God is under our control. We're going to put him in the house of our God. He's being controlled by that. Verse 3, when the Ashdites arose early the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. That's a, that's a position of submission. Whoa, 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 whoa. We, we brought God in here to be subject to Dagon, and now we got Dagon flat on his face before the ark of the covenant, the very presence of the God of the Hebrews. But that was probably, you know, sometimes people get bumped and there's jostling, and, and that was probably just a a quirk. So they took Dagon and set him in his place again. Now, if you're a little bit more cynical, you could say, well, Dagon needs human hands to prop him up. Verse 4, when they arose early the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon and both of the palms of his hands were cut off on the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left. In ancient times, the hands and the head, removing the hands and the head, were a grisly trophy of victory. 
Don't miss the symbolism here. Dagon is being defeated by the ark of the covenant, the very presence of God. Therefore, verse 5, neither the priests of Dagon nor all who enter Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon and Ashdod to this day. So the hand is a symbol of power. The hands of Dagon have been cut off. In the next seven verses, verses 6 through 12, the narrator's going to mention the hand of God three times. The Philistines will mention the hand of God one time. Here we go, verse 6. Now the hand of the Lord was heavy on the Ashdodites, and he ravaged them and smote them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territories. That's the hand of God coming against the people of Ashdod. When the men of Ashdod saw it was so, they said, the ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is severe on us, and Dagon our God. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You captured the ark, the presence of God, and you brought it into the house of your God, and now you're saying... The hand of the God of the Israelites is heavy on us and he's heavy on our God. That, that's starting to turn. But, but you, you can't deny what you're seeing. So if, if you're in Ashdod and you're breaking out with tumors, what do you want to do with this ark? Well, send it on. So that's what they do. When the men of Ashdod saw it was so, they said, Ark of God must not remain with us. Oh, I've already read that, but in case you miss it, you get it twice, a little bit more for your sermon. So, verse 8, they sent and gathered all the lords of the Philistines to them and said, what shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? And they said, let the ark of the God of Israel be brought to Gath. And they brought the ark of the God of Israel around. So how are you feeling if you're living in Gath at this point? Thanks. Yeah, I, I think, I, I don't want that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna blow up a bridge or something so they can't come. I, I don't want that. I'm here, I'm on the internet, I'm hearing what's going on. After, verse 9, after they had brought it around, here's our word again, the hand of God was against the city and was very, with very great confusion. He smote the men of the city, both young and old, so that tumors broke out on them. So what do they do? Gone from Ashdod, got tumors, going to Gath. What are they going to do? They're going to send that Hummer on. Verse 10. So they sent the ark of God to Ekron. And as the ark of God came to Ekron, the Ekronites cried out and saying, they have brought the ark of God of Israel around us to kill us and our people. They sent therefore and gathered all the lords of the Philistines and said, send away the ark of the God of Israel and let it return to its own place so that it will not kill us and our people. For there was deadly confusion throughout the city. Why? The hand of God was very heavy there. We go from Ashdod to Gath to Akron. You see a pattern here. And the men who did not die were smitten with tumors, and the cry of the city went up to heaven. So let's back up here. Not long ago, you take the Ark of the Covenant, go into battle, and you lose it. What do you think about God? Where is he? How did that happen? How is anything good going to come out of this? God looks weak. In those, that culture, you prove the strength of your God versus the other by, by the military conquest. And they had heard, the, the Philistines had heard about coming out of Egypt, and they thought this God's powerful, but their conclusion was we've conquered God. But they bring that into their land, and they take it to three cities. After they fall, see... The statue of their God on flatten his face with his hands and face cut off. They see tumors breaking out among three people. Well, maybe it's not as it appeared. Maybe God is working in this lost to make his name known. So I'm wondering about your life and my life. Do you have circumstances where you think this isn't going well? Sure seems like God is losing here. So what are you talking about, Andy? I'm talking about a cancer, the, the treatment, the numbers keep going the wrong way. I'm talking about a relationship with a spouse, a kid, a parent, an employer, an employee, that you're doing everything you know to do, and it ain't getting any better. I'm talking about a job search that, I mean, everybody says they're hiring, right? Everybody's hiring. And, and you think, where is God? 
Well, if, if we draw any conclusions from this, even when it seems like God is losing, he, he is present and he is working, moving his name and reputation forward. Now, now don't mistake that. There were, there were consequences to their foolish decision. People died. The ark was lost. There will be consequences, but that doesn't mean God isn't present and that God isn't working. Maybe for you it's not a personal thing, but it's something you see going on in culture. Oh, we're just a few months away from elections, aren't we? Isn't that great? Just a few months away from elections. And you think this candidate has got to win, but you know what? That candidate might win. And if that candidate wins, God is still present and he is still at work. And you see this bill or this thing is, needs to get passed and enacted and it doesn't. You know what? Even when that bill doesn't get passed and doesn't get enacted, God is still at work. There's never a reason for us to throw up our hands and think God's, no, he's sovereign, he's in control, and he's working. At least that's what's going on with the Philistines so far. Verse 6 says, uh, chapter 6 says this, Now the ark of the Lord had been in the country of the Philistines seven months. It's been a long seven months. And the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners saying, what shall we do with the ark of the Lord? That's a great question because it's causing all kinds of problems. Tell us how we shall send it to its place. They said, if you send away the ark of the God of Israel, do not send it empty, but you shall surely return to him a guilt offering. Then you will be healed and it will be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. If you're returning a guilt offering, you're guilty for something. What are they guilty of? They're guilty of thinking they could control the God of Israel. You thought you had this. You thought you could put him in your house, in your place, and you had it, and, and you were wrong. I mean, you were really, really wrong. And you need to make atonement for that. So how are you going to do that? Verses 4 and 5. Then they said, what shall we, the guilt offering, which we shall return to him? And they said, five golden tumors and five golden mice, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines. Make no mistake. They're representing their lords, and they're saying, we're sovereign to this God. For one plague was on all of you and on your lords. So you shall make likenesses of your tumors and likenesses of your mice that ravage the land, and you shall give glory to the God of Israel. Now, there's a statement. Perhaps he will ease his what from you? His hand from you. Your gods and your land. At least you can give the, the Philistines credit. They're, they're, they're learning from other people's mistakes. Look at verse 6. Why then do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts? When he had severely dealt with them, they did not allow the people to go, and they departed. They departed anyway. Uh, Pharaoh in Egypt cost his people because he would not recognize the power and sovereignty of God, and they kept suffering and suffering and suffering, and they said, let's not go that way. Let's not go that way. So they're going to um, devise one last test to see if this indeed was the Lord. And we get that test in verses 7 through 9. Now, therefore, take and prepare a new cart and two milch cows on which there has never been a yoke. And hitch the cows to the cart and take their calves home away from them. Take the ark of the Lord and place it on the cart and put the articles of gold which you return to him as a guilt offering in a box by its side. Then send it away that it may go. Watch, if it goes by the way of its own territory, the best Shemesh, then he has done us this great evil. But if not, then we will know that it was not his hand that struck us, it happened to us by chance. So, okay, we're going to put our five golden tumors, and we're going to put our five mice, we're going to put the ark in, we're going to put a cow, uh, put it on a cart, and we're going to hitch, hitch up two cows who've never been under a yoke. So they're going to fight against that. Moreover, we're going to leave their calves behind. That's not a, a cow's nature to leave its calf. So we're going to set up these obstacles, and if that thing doesn't go in a straight line to Beth Shemesh, then we know, yeah, it was, it was a fluke. But if it goes, then that's our final test. We know this was God. So how's this play out? Verses 10 through 12. Then the men did so, and the two milch cows, and hitched them to the cart and shut up their calves at home. They put the ark of the Lord on the cart and boxed with the golden mice and the likeness of their tumors, and they took the cow, and the cows took the straight way in the direction of Beth Shemesh, and they went along the highway, lowing as they went and did not turn aside to the right or to the left. And the lords of the Philistines followed them to the border of Beth Shemesh. So it takes a straight line. Got a question for you. If you're one of the lords of the Philistines and you're seeing all this go down, You've seen the tumor city to city to city. You set up this final test, and if it goes straight line, we'll know. You know, you set up these obstacles because they're leaving their calves, and they've been under yoke, and you see it go. You're going to turn to the Lord? 
of Israel? I mean, it's a hypothetical question. The text doesn't say. We don't know. But, yeah, God is giving them an opportunity to respond. So, we ask this question, what's our hope when God seems absent? Sure seemed absent when the ark was taken, didn't he? What's our hope? Here it is. God is ever-present, always working. Even in this loss, term intentionally, quotes, God is ever-present, always working. You know, in that guilt offering, they talked about the tumors and they made five mice, and the text doesn't say, we'll assume uh, that there was an outbreak, that the mice were taking the crops, and they felt like that was the hand of God, so they're making a guilt offering to represent both. Just, we don't know, but that's our guess as far as the text. Still, we have this situation that seems like, man, where is God? He seems absent. The ark was taken. We lost all these soldiers, but no, he was present in that, and he's working. So here's my question for you. What are the circumstances in your life where you think, man, I've been praying, and I've been asking, and nothing seems to change? I mean, it's a great story. It works out, right? At least we see a God-glorifying ending, but maybe you haven't seen that. See, that's the challenge of faith, to believe that God doesn't change. His character is true, and He's always working. So I didn't grow, I grew up in a church going home, but in my estimation, it wasn't a Christian home, and so when I went to work as a, in a campus ministry, vocational ministry, um, there were always kind of heated theological discussions when I would come home, um, and my parents, especially my dad, would press in, and what is it that you believe, and why do you got to do this? And, and so we would come down, and where it always came down to is the exclusivity of Christ. And it would, you know, I would share a verse like John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father through me. And my dad would say, well, Andrew... That's not what that means. And I'd say, Dad, I don't want to be disrespectful, but you don't know because you don't read the Bible. Why don't we read, not with the goal of tripping each other up, why don't don't we read the Bible together? And, you know, I'll be back out in Colorado, but we can talk about this. And he would say, Andrew, you're right, I should do that, but he he never did. He never did. Well, at 70 years old, he had a stroke, and, and each year he got progressively weaker, and he was told, don't take the stairs. And he, each year he didn't listen to that. At age 85, around Thanksgiving time, he fell. And he had serious, serious internal injuries. And this is up in New Jersey. My younger brother's trying to monitor this. And, and he's three months. And I would call in, in, the, in the hospital and wouldn't answer. And so about February, I have a conversation with my younger brother and realize they're supplementing him. My dad's incredibly weak. And he can't, he's not even strong enough to pick up the phone. So I think I, maybe that was a Wednesday, so I, I was scheduled to speak that Sunday, so I thought, that's short notice, but I got, I don't know, Ethan Lee Camper, Bill Cole, or somebody, will you help me out and take the next Sunday? I'm going home, because I need to talk to my dad. Well, in that week before I got home, he passed away. And I don't know, I'm hoping in those three months when he's sitting there with nothing going on and just having time to think that the words came back. He'd always said, I'm going to stand on my own. I said, Dad, if I read my Bible right, you're not going to make it on your own. I'm hoping, but, but I don't know what happened there. When I get home and we tell my mom with my younger brother, hey, Dad passed away, I realize how far her cognitive capabilities have slipped. I mean, she is into Alzheimer's and, and so anything I say to her, I mean, she's confused about who even died. You know, this, this has got a, a good outcome. Sometimes these stories don't have great outcomes, at least on earth. I mean, I don't know what's up with my dad. Here's what I do know. Got to ever present, always working. Well, Andy, how's that going to play out? I'm not sure. Not sure. I'll figure that out in eternity. But, but that's the hope we hold on to. God is ever-present, always working, even when we don't get what we want. Well, let's go back to our passage. The, 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 the ark is now in Israel, and we pick that up in verse 13. Now, the people of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley, and they raised their eyes and saw the ark and were glad to see it. 
the cart came into the field of Joshua, the Beth Shemite, and st stood there where there was a large stone. And they split the wood of the cart and offered the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. The Levites took down the ark of the Lord and the box that was in it, in which were the articles of gold, and put them on the large stone. And the men of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and sacri offered sacrifices that day to the Lord. When the five lords of the Philistines saw it, they returned to Ekron that day. And I'm still wondering, did you respond to the God of Israel? We don't know. These are the golden tumors which the Philistines returned for a guilt offering to the Lord, one for Ashdod, one for Gaza, one for Ash Ashkelon, one for Gath, and one for Ekron. That's, those are admissions of submission of those lords. And the golden mice, according to the number of all the cities of the Philistines, belong to the five lords both of the fortified cities and of the country villages. The large stone on which they set the ark of the Lord is a witness to the, this day in the field of Joshua the Beth Shemite. Verse 19 and 20, a little bit grim. He struck down some of the men of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. He struck down of all the people 50,070 men and the people mourned because the Lord had struck the people with a great slaughter. Then the people of Beth Shemesh said, who is able to stand before the Lord, this holy God? No one. And to whom shall he go up from us? You say, why? 50,070, why? And my answer is, I don't know. But I do want to take this lesson. Let's not trifle with God. That ark was the very symbol of his presence, and you were told to approach it in a certain way. Let's not be lackluster in our approach of God. Yes, Jesus is our friend. He is our Savior, absolutely. But he is the eternal Son of God. Let's not lose the awe and reverence that is rightfully his. He's perfect in those things, but let's not lose. Yes, he's our friend, he's our brother, but he is the eternal God. So here's what happens with the ark. They, verse 21, they sent messengers to the inhabitants of Kiram Jira, Kiriath Jerim, saying, the Philistines have brought back the ark of the Lord. Come down and take it up to you. Then the men of Kiriath Jerim came and took the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abdenab on the hill and consecrated Eleazar, his son, to keep the ark of the Lord. From that day that the ark remained at kiriath Jerim, the time was long, for it was 20 years, and all the house of the Lord, all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. Look, I hope this passage lifts our hearts and encourages us. God is always present ever-present, always working. But the reason we can live that assertion is because Jesus went to the cross alone. His first words on the cross were, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That was a separation from his Father. Why? 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, he who knew no sin, the description of Jesus, became sin in our place. He literally took sin on. And the Father can't look on sin. It, it's, and so there was a separation. Because Jesus endured that separation, you don't have to and I don't have to. And even when we're going crazy and wondering what is happening, um, we can know God is ever-present, always working. Now, I know for some of us, we're in circumstances and situations, Andy, this is really hard to believe. And that's part of the challenge of faith. There was a man who had a son that was um, demon-possessed, and the disciples couldn't pull it out, and Jesus is coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration, and uh, the guy's desperate. He says to Jesus, if, if you can, and Jesus said, if. And the guy says, I believe, help me in my unbelief. Isn't that not where some of us live? I do. If that's where you are, make that your prayer this morning. I believe. <laughs> Help me in my unbelief. When I get done, we're going to sing a song called Waymaker. It affirms that this God is always at work. Would you make that your prayer? Or say, God, I'm not there. Could you help me understand that? So in March of 2002, um, the elders at Sierra Vista Baptist Church and Andy McFarland thought, you know, it's probably best that we don't keep working. We had an amicable parting, and we said, we're going to take six months, and we're going to make it public so everybody knows, so there's no rumors. And you look, and we'll look. And, and so I was free to talk to everybody that's 
um, and I look broadly evangelical, evangelical free, all, all, all kinds of different denominations. Well, my, my home denomination was with the Southwest Conservative Baptist Association, and they saw my campus crusade background, and they said, you ought to plan a church. Oh, really, where? Well, Phoenix. We were about three hours from Phoenix. We are in the southeast corner of the state, and I said, well, gee, I don't know anybody in Phoenix. Well, let me tell you about Phoenix. Phoenix, and this is in 2002, is um, clearing 28 acres a day for development. Phoenix at that time was getting 7,000 brand new people a month moving to the metro area. So in a little less than four years, you move all of Lincoln, Lancaster County to metro Phoenix. And let's think about the churches and, and just kind of where it was. People were buying lots, holding them, and then flipping them in three months and making $50,000. Not houses, lots. That's where it was. And, and we need churches. And I thought, well, oh, maybe, may, I don't feel like I'm a church planner, but Maybe. So I drove up, to, it's about a three-hour trip up to Phoenix, and that night on I-10, there's a fatal accident, so everybody has to go off, so a three-hour trip becomes a five-hour trip. And I stay that night with a guy, he's a church planner, he had moved down from New York, and, and he says, Andy, tomorrow you're going to hear about Palm Croft Community Church, and they're at 600 after six months, and they've had this many people come to Christ, and blah, 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 and it's all true, but what he's not going to tell you is they started with 250 people. Um, his father-in-law is the uh, senior pastor of the biggest conservative Baptist church in the country, is, which is in Metro Phoenix, and they planted out of that church, and they got 50,000 up front, and blah, 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 blah. So the next day, I meet all these different church planners, and I hear from this guy, and I get a glowing report, and I talk to about six or seven other guys who are dying. They are getting nowhere. And I, I mean, I've only met them, but they seem like good guys. They seem like uh, committed to the cause of Christ, gifted, but they're all kind of dying. And in fact, one of the guys I met when I left Sierra Vista to come to Lincoln Berean, uh, ended up being the interim pastor where I was. He just folded his plant. That was a really long drive back to Sierra Vista because I thought, I don't know anybody, a church that couldn't launch me out. I don't, I don't know anybody. And I, I know you need um, resources. You need people and money. God, why did I make this trip? So I hire on at Lincoln Berean, and they've got a north church plant, but they've already picked the guy to do that. And uh, a month later, he comes in, and he candidates, and it doesn't go very well. And about nine months later, I get an email from Brian Clark, who's the senior pastor there, who is known for his short, cryptic emails. Uh, lunch Tuesday, September 12th. Well, people, when the boss man says, lunch Tuesday, September 12th, here's what you say. You say, absolutely, what time and where? And I thought, I didn't think I was going to get fired, but I said, Hope, I, I think I'm going to be corrected here. And um, he wants to talk to me about the church plant. And he says, I'm going to put you up front for a year, speak so people get to know you. You can recruit anybody. I said, Brian, anybody? Anybody. I said, okay, I'm taking you at your word. And we're going to guarantee your salaries for the first month. We're going to give you 50000 up front to launch this and that and the other. And I thought, okay. Now I understand the trip to Phoenix. For 18 months, I thought, what's the deal? We're going to be self-reliant? We're going to be reliant on this God who says, I'm ever-present, always working. That's our hope. When God seems absent, ever-present, always working. Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, we're grateful for the truth of this passage that you are ever-present, always working. And sometimes uh, it doesn't seem like that. Um, but if we're struggling to believe, would you help us in our unbelief as we proclaim this truth that you are a way maker? If we don't believe it, would we hold on to it? If, if, if we're there, would it encourage us that even though we don't see it, you're working? Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.